You want me to intro? Yeah. <laughs> this is hilarious. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> if we, we might as well just do the whole thing. What did you do? Look at my name. You're the point guard. This is greatness. He said, to the extent I desire to move through you, you must allow me to cut on you. The leader's cut. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the leader's cut. Uh... I am Tim Ross, and uh, I am here with my twin brother, Preston, and he asked me to run point on You're this. making me laugh so hard right now. This is so fantastic. <laughs> You're not some guest host. You're my oh twin. Oh, my goodness. He had me run point on this, on this why episode. So, hey, I'm so grateful you're here, and um, I hope you're dialed in for cheat codes. I hope you're dialed in to... Um, learn, grow, develop, be challenged, um, and ultimately be inspired to do everything that God has spoken and placed in your heart to do. So uh, we're going to jump right in. And what was a burden on my heart that I wanted to talk about was work ethic. Um, because I think a lot of times, especially in ministry, uh, people actually think that just believing God and, you know, waiting for him to do something supernatural is going to lead to every breakthrough in their life and open up these doors for utterance and speaking engagements and church and growth and, yeah, nah. It doesn't work like that. It don't work like that. Um, and, and so... I think what I want to do in this episode is like demystify communication, leadership, um, success, uh, and kind of just peel it back past the God did <laughs> to the I did. It's just I just got a picture of college. Playing golf. God did. God did. <laughs> DJ, Khaled. DJ Khaled has <laughs> one of the most successful lives imaginable for God a DJ. Did. God did. <laughs> God did. Every time he makes a putt. God, God did. God did. I love it. So, um, yeah, that's what I want to get into. I want to get into work ethic. I want to get into um, what it's like to... Um, not just reach success, but sustain it. And while acknowledging the God component, that God is the one that elevates, God gives favor, there is a sharpening of the sword. There is a work, there is a work ethic that you have to have to arrive somewhere and then stay somewhere right. over a sustained period of time. Getting there isn't the goal. Remaining there is. Your gift will bring room for you, will make room for you and bring you for great, b bring you before great men. I, I, let me just calibrate and say that that's actually talking about a bribe. That has nothing to do with spiritual gifts. We've made that correlation, has nothing to do with it. Uh, but since everybody uses it, I, I just want to at least give you context before we actually pivot from there. So talk to me about that work ethic for yourself. Like, what has that looked like for you? Yeah, I think, I, so when I look back kind of on my path, I got to watch another human ride their ride, things explode in a, in a God-ordained way mm -hmm. in, right in front of them, mm -hmm. uh, and then was sent out to start from scratch. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm one of the mistakes can be that you're going to make a lateral move. Mm -hmm. You don't, I, I was never going to start where that man was in his late forties. That's correct. That's correct. Because I was stepping in in my early thirties. That's correct. 
And so part of it is just retraining your brain to go just because somewhere someone else is somewhere else. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. It doesn't correct. mean that's where I'm absolutely. going to start or where I must start. Absolutely. I just have to start wherever God says. Yeah, absolutely correct. And the Lord calibrated me and said, hey, it's not going to start the way everybody expects. Mm -hmm. The plow is going to be in your hands mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so you settle in yep. and say, okay, this is a season of preparation. Yep. When the Lord tells you it's a season of preparation, you have two options. One, to embrace work ethic. Right. Or two, right. to act like it's vacation. Right. It, you're either wow. in cruise ship mode or cruise missile mode. Yes. When you're preparing. That's right. But if, if, if you are uh, idolizing the moment, yep. I don't know that you'll be ready for it. Yep. Derek Jeter wasn't Derek Jeter because he got an opportunity to play in Yankee Stadium. That's correct. Derek Jeter became Derek Jeter because in the World Series, he did what others couldn't do. Right. And how was he able to do what others couldn't do? He prepared. That's right. In ways very few did. That's absolutely correct. So I think I, I want to hear you talk about, because we started talking about off camera, yep. using the children of Israel. Yep, absolutely. A, as a frame of reference yep. to go, okay, especially with the younger leaders, in the era of social media, everyone is seeing everyone's pinnacle moments, Absolutely. but none of their it's plowing. It's a highlight None of reel. their plowing. Highlight reel. We That's got right. all these pinnacles. That's right. No plows. That's right. And so it, it's going to exactly what you're saying. It's conditioned everybody to just think about the pinnacle. Absolutely correct. And to think it happens in a moment. It's never. As opposed to a thousand moments. Nothing in the kingdom ever happens overnight. Can't find it. So... Um, to, to set this backdrop, the, 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 the thing I've been musing over is, um, the children of Israel being promised Canaan, God letting them know it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And the imagery that we've romanticized is that there's several crates of gallons of milk and jars of honey that's already been prepackaged. When the truth of the matter is, there were cows littered across the hillside that had not been corralled, and there were beehives dripping with honey waiting to be drawn out, but not without a thousand bee stings. So, so when we think about the promised land, this picture of success, we romanticize it to the point that we take out how much work was involved. 100%. I got to fight for the land, drive everybody off the land, come back to the land, settle the land, yep. distribute the land, and then start living in it. That's that's six steps right it's there. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And so I don't think we're doing a good job of preparing people. We, we talk about the promise and if you remain faithful, God's going to do it. As if there's nothing for you to do. Right. Between now and then. And then when you get there, all you got to do is coast. And that's not it. Jerry Rice did not play 20 years without running up that hill in the offseason. Jerry Rice made millions of dollars off of three and five yard slants. Why? He ran the route crisper than anybody else, which meant whether he was 28 or 38, mm -hmm. it mattered not. The route he ran, even with a defensive back knowing. Yeah. What he was going to do, still couldn't stop it. That's work ethic. So that's what I, that's what I want to explore and kind of calibrate for what we do in the leaders cut. Anybody that wants to cheat code, mm -hmm. anybody that wants to go, oh, I, wait a minute, I'm 22 and I can start doing that now. now. All right. So let's talk about 2008. We meet. We fall in love with each other and we make a covenant. We're going to read the Bible more than we read yep. any other book. 
let's break that down and talk about what we believed at the time that we are supposed to be incredible Bible teachers. Mm -hmm. That we believe God has called us not for a season as young adult pastors to do this and then maybe spin off right. into business. We feel like we're supposed to be doing this for the rest of our lives. And if we're going to do this for the rest of our lives, first of all, this Bible needs to be meaningful to us. And second, we need to have fresh bread when we step up to communicate whether it was for three minutes right. or whether it's for 35. The amount of time was irrelevant. Yep. Everything was an opportunity to grow and every opportunity to grow presents an opportunity to prepare. Mm. And so I would say, I, I'm grateful that I got seven years or six years as a young adult pastor to learn how to communicate and find my voice. But I found my strength at a table with you. Mm. Because we literally, there's zero exaggeration here. We would literally sit for our average lunches. They were three plus hours. Yeah, for sure. I mean, every time. Yeah, three, th three and a half. Easy. There were two books on yeah. that table. That's, a, that's absolutely correct. Every single time. <laughs> and the amount of ping pong back and forth. That's right. I learned how to hear. Yep. I learned how to speak. Yep. I learned how to dig. Yep. And I learned how to be prepared for our lunches. Mm. So long before we had a, a, a mic in front of our mouth, so to speak, right. where a bunch of young adults were listening. Yep. There was one listening. There was one at the table listening. That's right. That's exactly right. And I, I, I'm sure you did. Because yep. you don't just show up to that lunch nah, with things you found in the book nope. that the Holy Spirit showed you yep. if you haven't been pouring through it. That's exactly right. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that, Thursday actually, to get to Friday. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so taking it seriously. Yep. Is, is a huge deal. Yep. You could make the case, well, only Tim is going to see this. <laughs> really? Nah, fam. Because I felt like we had... A third sitting at our table. Oh, buddy. Watching and testing. Absolutely correct. Not just enjoying our testing. Yep, absolutely. If you're going to be one book men. Yep. All right. So so um, talk to me about what your preparation looked like and if it's changed, what it looks like now. Because we're talking about 08 and now yep. 2023. So what did it look like then? And if it has changed, what does it look like now? Yeah. Well, and let me, let me say one more thing, because a lot of people ask me about my prep time 27 years in. Right. And it is not the no. same as my prep because time. Because tens of thousands of hours have been logged. <laughs> That's exactly right. So talk to me about then and now. Yeah. Well, if I were, if I were to look at it like a pilot. Mm-hmm. Your first thousand hours, let's say, if you're going to be an instructor, mm -hmm. there's a ton of learning. Yep. But the best instructors have 10,000 hours. Yep. You get to 10,000 hours of instruction of flight time. Yep. You can fly the airplane with your eyes closed. Yep, for sure. I mean, literally. Yep. So it's much easier to do the same thing 10,000 hours in as it was the first hundred hours. Yeah, for sure. So I would say... It was a lot more laborious back then. Mm -hmm. It, it mm -hmm. was a lot harder. Mm -hmm. I would have to dig. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, Absolutely. You know, I'd, I'd have to get through uh, for every, let's just say, three verses that I felt something, the Holy Spirit would illuminate something for me that I shared with you. I mean, I, it wouldn't surprise me if I had spent about three hours. You know, I mean, it, it was just with three verses for three verses yep. that I got my bell rung yep. with it, that it was three hours of just pouring through scripture yep. and commentary. So I it, in the early season of walking out our calling, there's just a lot of logging time. Yeah, you're learning. Yeah, for sure. You know, but then you go you fast forward to where we are now. Um, it, It's you've put in so much time. Yeah. You've read that chapter now. Back then, it was probably the seventh time I had read that chapter in scripture. And now, <laughs> 15 years later, <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. You We've know, lost count. Right. I, I used to actually remember that one year. I mean, we put in like 10,000 chapters between the two of us. Uh -huh. Remember that one year? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was insane. Yeah, yeah, like for it, sure. It was yeah, actu yeah. We, actually yeah. uh -huh. insane. We were excavators. It was crazy. Yeah, we were excavators. And I, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put a mark every time I read the same chapter. Yep, you know? yep I remember and it that. just got 
where it was like, yeah. <laughs> right, right. You're going to start crossing out scriptures <laughs> yeah. at that point. Well, <laughs> you get through James. <laughs> right, yeah, right, right. Six straight times. So you're like, yeah, the, I'm not going to be able to yeah, remember for sure. all this. But it was about logging time. Yep. You know? Yeah. It, it's The world might say paying your dues. I don't think that's how the Lord says it. Uh, I don't think we're earning anything. I think we're learning mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. All right. So for me... When I first started, because the Bible's always been a pickup, a, 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 a pop up book. So when I first started, I was so desperately afraid of like getting something wrong, like saying something like the Bible says this, but then I said something that that don't mean. Mm -hmm. So I was with a Thompson Chain Reference uh, uh, study Bible and uh, a Strong's Concordance. And the only commentary my dad had back then was Matthew Henry. So I was left with the longest winded <laughs> commentator that I knew at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And as long winded as Matthew Henry was, there was gold on the way to his points. It was archaic in its, in its uh, verbiage, but there was gold on the way to his point. Yeah. And I learned to slow down and not rush to get to my point and that I could pick up treasure on the way to the treasure mm -hmm. box, right? It's like following a trail of money to the money bag. Great. <laughs> right, right? So, so when I first started, I would write out um, the whole message and then I would get up and rehearse the message over and over and over again. Yeah. Because I'm not good with manuscript. I'm not good with having to refer back to notes a lot. And so what I did was I just got up and I began to just dry run my sermon. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. Mm -hmm. Instead of just like going over notes and then hope this works, I'd actually read through it like an actor would read through his lines. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And how is my voice sound? And how do I want to paint this picture? And where are the inflections? And and then obviously that dry run is completely different when the oil flows. Uh, but by that time, if I've gone through it three to five times, I know where I am. There's some muscle memory. There's some yep. muscle memory. I know how I'm getting in and I know how I'm getting out that oil is going to slide me into places yep. that I know nothing of that's going to hit the hearts of the men and women that are in the room. Um, and I trust and rely on the Holy Spirit for that. But I came prepared. Mm -hmm. Like there is no like, hope this works. It's going to work. <laughs> it worked on me. Right. Like, you know what I mean? I know this is a good message. Like I'm not crossing my fingers hoping it's good. I know it's good. But there were there there was practice behind and repetition behind right. getting up there and oh my God, I wish I could preach without notes. Y you actually can. Right. Go practice. It's, this is again, I want to demystify. For sure. You know what I mean? In the early days, you don't rely on your gift because right. you're growing in your gift. Mm -hmm. In the early days, you rely on your grit. That's ugh. That's nasty. So the man. first time I, when I preached at 2121, 1,600-seat room at that time was the biggest room I'd ever preached in, I literally went on Thursday night mm -hmm. and Friday night because I had to do Saturday night and Sunday night mm -hmm. live. Thursday night, all, I had one of the audio guys yep. come up, mm -hmm. set everything up for me, mm -hmm. put the exact mic I was going to speak in. Wow. I, I mean... Made sure yeah. it was bent already. Yeah, 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 yeah. Literally ran through the message four times that night. Okay. Friday night went back three times. So by Saturday night, the first service, I had already preached that message seven times. And that's on that stage. Because think about just little run throughs point by point when you're studying, you know, and I get we're talking about preaching. But this is really, you apply, apply the principle absolutely to whatever correct. your thing absolutely is. Correct. Absolutely correct. It was grit. Yeah, absolutely I correct. I knew God had given me a gift. Yep. But if you don't partner grit yeah. 
with the gift. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. The gift isn't going to make room. No, no, it's absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it is like, I hope they like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Absolutely correct. I'm not hoping. Yeah. I'm checking. Yeah. And then if it doesn't land on me, I'm yeah. going to tweak it yeah. before I see if it lands on them. Absolutely. But seven times. I probably went too far back in the early days yeah, yeah, yeah. where you helped me rely a little more on muscle memory. Yeah, for sure. And wrote yeah, memory. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. You know, memorizing yeah. the script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was the grip. Yeah. I Man, I, I thank you for sharing that because as I hear you talk about that, I'm, I'm thinking through the first time the congregation heard it was the eighth time you had actually preached it. When I when I hear guys that say, uh, young guys, right? Like I'm trying to grow, and but I, I'm not getting a lot of opportunities to speak. I want to get better at speaking, and I'm like, well, how many times do you preach? And they're like, well, I'm not getting a lot of engagements right now. And how do how do you set up to like get doors opened? And because nobody's calling me, and I, and I'm thinking to myself, did you hear what I just asked you? Like how many times? How many times do you preach? Yeah, how many times do you preach? Well, I'm not. Not how many like, places? Nah, fam. You got a mirror, champ. How many times have you preached this message? Well, I've only preached three times in my life. I, I didn't. I didn't ask you how many times you've performed. <laughs> I asked you how many times have you preached? Because ballers ball. I'm gonna be at. LA Fitness on a pickup game. Cause I'm balling. Have you made the NBA squad yet? No. But today is Tuesday. It's 8 a.m. I've already had my protein shake. I'm about to go run for five hours. Painters paint. Oh, do you have any of your art in an exhibit in a museum? No. You think I need a stage to showcase this? If I don't paint, I'm not living. Singers sing. Have you been signed to a deal yet? What are you no. But if I don't write and perform and sing, if this is who you really are. See, I'm, I'm so grateful we're talking about this because I think the church has pushed people into places they're not gifted or gritted for. Mm. And because we only have like five slots here <laughs> in the local church, we think everybody that has charisma and can string together a sentence should be a pastor or a communicator or a youth pastor or a small group leader. And it's like, you got to figure out if this is for you. Because a lot of these guys, Prez, are not finding out until they're lead pastors. Right. That I don't think I was ever supposed to do this. And it's hard on them, their families. They've wasted, some of them, 20, 20 years. Because I'm just going through the motions and this is what I was supposed to be doing. It's never come natural. I don't really feel it. But this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And my leader said I should. And I want to be faithful and loyal. I'm trying to get people out the pulpit. <laughs> right like maybe your work ethic is going to take you to owning like a business where right. you make 12 million dollars a year in revenue and maybe you can use that oratorical gift to just be a great leader maybe you're supposed to own like five mcdonald's franchises like i just if you're going to do this though you got to go all in and it's going to be work mm-hmm I just think sometimes we get too fixated on the place. The, Agreed. The, the promised land, the place of the promised land. And memory might not serve me correctly when I quote this verse. Your word is a lamp mm. to my feet mm. and, a, and a light mm. for my place. Mm. It doesn't say that, does it? A light unto my path. path. It's the path. That's right. We spend too much time talking about the place. Mm. It's the path. And the path is filled with various destinations. Right. Right. That are all a part of the calling. Right. 
my responsibility is to stay on the path, not to make sure I can get into the place. Right. He right. opens the door. Right. Not me. Right. My hand can't open that door. Yeah, absolutely. Youth pastor. Yep. Young adult pastor. Yep. Campus pastor. Yep. Senior pastor. Yep. There was a path. Yeah, that's God had for me. Yeah, absolutely. Preparation correct. was involved. Hard work was involved at every place. I just think it's a fool's errand to think that God hands out places and callings like this. Here you go. I think he issues a responsibility. I think he issues a challenge and says, there's a place I'd like to go with you. But Preston, it's going to be excruciating and expensive. Would you like to go with me? And then to your point, then he, when we say yes, he says, okay, you got to fight to win the land. That's exactly correct. Then you got to run them out of the that's, land. That's absolutely correct. He that's seems absolutely literally correct. starts. Okay, yeah, bro. Well, then here's the path. That's absolutely Paths correct. involve steps. That's absolutely, that's absolutely correct. This, you're going to get it, but this is how. But you're not going to levitate. You're not going to float your way into the land of the promise. All right. So thank you for highlighting the fact that there is a difference between places and pathways. What's what needs to be discussed now and elaborated on is what that pathway looks like. So I did stand up comedy for two years. There's a guy in um uh rumor has it you might at some point come back to stand up comedy. I yes. Is this an unfounded rumor or is no, this, a, th this is a, this more is, than a rumor. This is this is fact. Okay. This is fact. So um there's a guy uh, in Dallas, who's basically the Yoda and rite of passage to be a Dallas comedian. His name is Dean. Dean used to write for Leno. He used to write for um, DeGeneres. And uh, settled down in Dallas and started a school. And basically, there's, it's six to eight weeks. And you, you lab with other aspiring comedians. Um and because of his reputation, uh, your graduation recital, as it were, is three minutes at the improv. Obviously, improv is an A-list club. Improv, Laugh Factory. Um, it's a premier club, right? So the improv in Addison is the place where you do your recital. It's it's the friendliest crowd you're gonna you're gonna have for a long time because uh, it's only comprised of the family and friends of the comedians that are gonna be there, so they're all supporting each other, and it's it's really good. Um, I go through the six week program. I learn how to you know to structure funny, right? Not just be funny, but to structure funny. And here's the only thing that was drilled into my head for six weeks, write your jokes, get to the funny, get better. You're gonna do the improv and then kiss it goodbye. Cause you're never going to be here again for a minimum two years, if you're dope. It's gonna take you two to five years to get back to the improv once you're done with graduation. I think that's very important to say. And it's a recall to what you said earlier about you being sent to plant this church. 100% I was about to connect. I mean, <laughs> you left the improv in South Lake. But kissing goodbye. Right. Not going to be preaching to 40,000 people a weekend. Your first month out the gate, <laughs> right? So, so preparing people, right? Because once again, social media is giving you a highlight reel of the places, right? And not preparing you for your pathway to get to whatever place he wants you to be. Oh, let me look right in this camera and say, if you have a bucket list of places that you want to preach, I beg you to rip it up now. Because you will loathe the pathway 
God puts you on, if you already have a list of places that you want him to place you in. So please just throw it in the trash now. <laughs> that way you can be blissfully surprised to the doors he opens as opposed to a little bit disappointed that he hasn't opened the doors that you desire to be in. I just want to put that out there for whoever needs to hear it. All right, so there's a difference between the improv. 100%. And we've and seen so much disappointment expecting improv to improv. And God's process never involves going from Laugh Factory to Laugh Factory. It's Laugh Factory to show, to give us a glimpse. Yeah, absolutely. I want you to see I'm what's gonna possible. I'm going to give you a glimpse. This is possible. For the days you want to quit. Yeah. I'm Absolutely. Gonna, I'm gonna give you oil yep. for that stage Good. for a 30 minute set. Good. Good. And then I'm gonna take you from the laugh factory to anonymity. <laughs> a full room. That's right. To no room. That's exactly right. And you're gonna have to go build the room. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. Dave Chappelle, um, he went on his journey, he went on his path. And ultimately gave up 50 G's. I'm sorry, 50 million. I was about to say. Please excuse me. <laughs> Walked away from 50 million, moved to the middle of nowhere, and is now building a club that seats 120 people for up and coming artists to lab. Because when you fall in love with the path and not the place, you just want to stay on the path. Whether I'm preaching to a room of 30,000 mm -hmm. or 30, it matters not to me because I fell in love with the path that God took me on, not the places. When the place is through. your addiction, or your idol, you'll visit very few of them. Kaya ya. But when the path slow down, fam. Stop playing. When the path. No, 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 no. Yeah. I said slow down. I, Can you I am. Just go back and say the first part again. When the place <sighs> is your addiction or idol. Yes, sir. You will visit very few of them. Mm. But when the path is your addiction as well as the smile on his face mm. rather than the feet, your, the place where your feet will be. Yeah. Timmy, when the path he has for me is my heart's desire, he takes me more places That's than exactly I ever right. dreamt. That's possible. exactly right. That's exactly right. But it's, it's a trick. I'm yeah. convinced it's a trick of the enemy to get us fixated on the place. Yeah. Yeah, because then I mean, how many how many people have we seen, no matter what field, where it, it's when God speaks a place, people take it as a promise. Right, right. The place was never the promise. And once you think it's a promise, yep. some people think you don't have to do anything to step into it. Mm. You just have to wait to receive it. Mm. Doing nothing is the worst way to prepare for mm. everything. Mm hmm. And listen, one of the things I learned about the last 10 years, anonymity is one of God's sweetest gifts. Oh, absolutely correct. Timmy, just in the last 24 hours, do you know, I've seen several YouTubers who, huge channels, mm -hmm. like not even in the Christian space. Yep. Who are stepping out, taking a break, one to two million subscribers. But it's, it's weighing them down. Yeah. And you hear things like, I can't even live my life. Right. It, I'm just living from episode to episode. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're living for the channel. Yeah. What I hear when they say that is, we focus so so hard on getting to this place. Yep. And now we're here. Yep. We're not on any kind of a path. We are just repeating yep. this thing over and over yep. and over again. It's good. Listen, when God gives us anonymity, we should see it as a kiss on the forehead. Yep. Because once 
people are watching. Yep. There is more. It's one thing to preach to yourself in a mirror right. and get better. Right. It's another thing to go preach at a pastor's conference yep. with 4,000 in the room. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so whatever period of time God gives you to prepare, yeah, steward it well. It's really good, bro. Oh, it's so good. And it's enjoy so not good. being at the improv. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah, bro. And get around a few people who That's see right. the improv as a curse for a little That's while. Exactly they right. hate it. That's exactly right. And then it will calibrate you That's just exactly to go, right. I, I just need to wake up and enjoy yeah. God's process yeah. and God's path for yeah. my life. Yes. Rather yeah. than curse it. Yeah, bro. Yeah. So I, I I did the improv and that three minutes went by fast. <laughs> and it always um, does. I haven't been back to the improv. I did, you know, I did the singles conference and the youth group and I was working at Nissan at the time. And I remember doing comedy for the most stuck up group out of the entire corporation, which is the financial analysts. I had to do comedy for them. I think they laughed three times. <laughs> Uh, in like a 15 minute set. Um, but it made me fall in love with the process. That's what Rogan's in love with. That's what Chappelle's in love with. They're in love with the process. Right. Like all of their success has endeared them to the path, not made them idolize the place. And the same thing has happened for us where I know I can say for the seven years uh, at embassy, and I know you say for the years that you've been at Pillar, 10 in now, that it doesn't matter who's here. Right. As long as he's here, that's all I care about. This attendance number could ebb and flow. My identity is not found in, right. oh, we, we just hit a new watermark, or, oh, we're two feet below the last watermark, I wonder what I'm doing wrong. There's an ebb and flow to the body. A healthy body eliminates, right? A healthy body takes in mm -hmm. and a healthy body releases. Mm -hmm. That's what a healthy body does. I always tell leaders, if it's hard to get out or it's running out of you, it's unhealthy. Mm. But if it's just flowing, flowing out, mm -hmm. if it's just flowing, it's supposed to happen. People come, people go. You breathe in, you breathe out. You take up and you let go. Like it's that's the that's the rhythm. But if you're not working on you in that process, I I remember um uh when I wanted to take the negotiation the negotiating class. You were an elder at the mm. church at the time at Embassy City, and um. Uh, I know for sure one of the elders was perplexed, like, why, why, <laughs> like, why would you even, you're not going to a leadership conference to like, you know, you're, hey, I want to go to, you know, the global leadership conference. I'm like, I want to take. <laughs> I remember. I didn't understand. I, 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 I mean, I trusted you, but I, did, I mean, it, it was, it seemed so random. Now, on the other side, it was genius. <laughs> Wisdom is proven to be right by its results. But I was that insatiable appetite to learn and grow, I had no idea how much getting trained in the art of negotiations was going to help me as a leader yeah. of a church and prepare me to transition the church that I was leading to new right. leaders right. and get a whole church on board in 90 days. That wasn't the anointing only. Right. That wasn't just God just worked. Hey, how did you transition the church and it's successful and it's growing after your departure? A well-beloved pastor transitions to a guy 12 years his younger and the church grows on top of that. Well, you know, just the Lord just, he just smiled on us. That's true. Mm -hmm. And, and. <laughs> I knew how to put together a very sophisticated accusations audit and attuned to 
attuned <laughs> empathetically to an entire congregation that I knew was going to feel like they were being portrayed by their leader. I could dial into that because of the way I had been trained. That did not come from the Bible. I went and acquired a skill right. that I thought was just going to benefit me personally. And it wound up benefiting the entire organization. Again, I want to demystify some of this stuff, Prez, because people are walking around going, that dude's just a better, Craig Rochelle's just a better leader than me. Right. Dang it. I, I'm never going to catch that guy. My, Michael Tosh is better, just a better storyteller. I, I'm never going to be that guy. Rich Wilkerson, oh, he looks like DiCaprio. He just has stunningly good looks. I'm never going to be that guy. And the truth of the matter is, those guys I just named have a work ethic. They were doing it before anyone was watching. They have grit and gift. A big audience can't be an excuse to wait to begin trying. If you wait for a big game to play your best game, you never will. Child, don't get me started on this, Press. Don't get me started on this because um, one of my biggest pet peeves with preachers, I'm not just going to um, assign this to young preachers, just preachers, period, is when they have the thought in their mind, I need, I need a crowd to practice in front of. That's malpractice. <laughs> when I hear a guy tell me, yeah, I'm trying out a new sermon. See if it works. I'm starting to, I'm practicing more. At a conference? On a weekend service? To your youth group? To your young adults? To this small group? Fam, I call that malpractice. It's too late. You need a fully attended stadium to practice? That's, that's malpractice. I, I don't want you to try out your sermon on me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Well, we have multiple services and... You know, usually the first service is where I just kind of work out the lucid. So that first crowd doesn't matter? That first crowd is where you work out the kinks? That's malpractice. You just said that a third of your services are the guinea pig to button it up for the other two? If the chew fish just wear it, dog. Like, everybody has to matter. Where do you practice? You don't practice on game day. You don't practice on game day. You run your practice sets on off days, not on game days. Here's the reality, though. In, especially in the early days, there's no such thing as an off day. Mm. That's really good. That's the principle. That is the principle. Until off days yep. become your game days. That's it. You will never see oil on game day. Ooh. That's the principle. Yeah. Yeah. Are the people so important, Preston, that you'll spend 10 years preparing to lead them? Or will you wait to do the things you know you need to do to be prepared on day one? If you do, mm. you won't make it to day 1,000. Mm -hmm. But if you spend the next 3,650 days mm -hmm. preparing for day one, I'll give you access to oil. But if the place becomes more important to you than the people, you won't show up. That's right. To that place. That's absolutely right. Prepared. That's absolutely correct. For the people. That's absolutely correct. And I can't use you. Yeah. I can't press and you'll visit. Yeah. 
but you won't even make it through victory. Mm. Remember stage one, you got to fight, fight them out, run them out. That's exactly right. So I just, I, I think this addiction to the place is, I heard Chris Hodges say the other day, he was talking about, you know, in his context is obviously ministry, but he was saying, you know, the, I get asked all the time, what's the best part of, you know, doing what you do, obviously become very successful, not just in ministry, but in leadership. And he said, essentially, it's traveling the path with my friends. Mm. Most people think it's the places I've been. Mm. Timmy, once you get there, it's never the places. That's exactly right. It's the path. That, it's always with been your the path. people. It's always been the path. It's always been. It's the path. The path. Yeah. My favorite part about starting Pillar is doing it with my people. That's absolutely correct. Absolutely. That's correct. the. This is why we do yeah. what we isn't the platform. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If I fell in love with the place, I'd only be preaching to black people for the rest of my life. Yes, of course, I'm going there. If you fall in love with the place, you can wind up missing a whole world. There are lots of places out there filled with lots of people. But falling in love, so to 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 like really, because this is this is this is good to flesh out. Falling in love with the place actually cuts off the path. You you, you don't see a path because you don't even look for it anymore. Because mm -hmm. I love this place so much, I don't care what the other paths are. I was at Potter's House for four years as a young adult pastor. 70% of the churches I preached in outside of Potter's House were white churches. And I went to Anglican churches and Presbyterian churches. I went to Lutheran churches. I went to a church of Nazarene. I went to the Bahamas, Canada, UK, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, Costa Rica. Because I was in love with the path he had me on. And because when the Lord saw that place didn't impress you enough to hunker down and stay. All right, cool. You want to go to, you want to go to the Bahamas? Beautiful island. They put you up in the Atlantis. You preach at this great church, but you're not enamored with it. You, you're asking me where to next, Lord. Cool. Let's go to, let's go to London. You got to see. The palace and Big Ben. And instead of being a tourist, you come back and say, where to next, Lord? Let's go to a commonwealth. Let's, let's go to Australia. You're going to love Australia. It's going to be like a second home to you, Tim. <laughs> you mean to tell me you love this place? You would call it your home right now, but you're still asking me, where to next, Lord? Let's go to Singapore. Oh my goodness, you got to meet your Singaporean family. Prez, my life, my passport is full of stamps because I fell in love with the pathway. We are meant to be people of the path. And once you get to the place, you realize it's just about the people. Yes. You, you described one of the best comedians on the planet right now. Got to the place, mm -hmm. Chappelle. Mm -hmm. And now, building a 120-seat room for young ones yep, to grow in their gift. That's exactly right. And learn the grit. That's exactly right. He got to the place. That's exactly right. Actually kind of turned a big part of the place down. This is it. Oh, absolutely. Because you just realized absolutely. it's the path. It, it's the path, man. It's, it's the, the path. path. It is never yeah. about a nah, place. Nah. You go to nah. Australia. When yeah. I hear you talk about Australia, yeah. I don't hear you talk about how great the beach is. No. While it's great. It is great. I hear you talk about the people. That's exactly right. And then you go to the, this is this, what Paul, that's exactly this was right. it. Yeah, that's exactly it's right. It's not about my destination. That's exactly right. So if it's not about the place, why start the path, the journey on the path 
by idolizing the place. That's right. The path will just take longer. <sighs> yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. Oh my God, I know this is helping me. This what did the a, children of Israel do? This is a cheat code. Fam. They got so bothered about the place they were in because the place they were in wasn't the place they were promised. Mm. And so they said we'd rather go back to the worst place. Timmy. It's not worth idolizing the place. It's not, dude. It's the not. path is too much fun. Yeah. For sure it is. For sure it is. And the place doesn't last that long. You, The best line in this whole deal so far is, that three minutes went fast. It goes to. Timmy, it always goes fast. That seven years went fast. I never thought I was going to pastor a church for 30 years. You couldn't have paid me to believe it'd be less than 10. That seven years went fast, fam. But because my heart was open to say, where to next? Mm -hmm. I now podcast for a living? Why? Because I never made it about the place. Mm -hmm. And the same work ethic that I had. Right. Leading a church is the same work ethic right. I have leading an, an, a for-profit organization. I'm not living a charmed life that doesn't exude effort. <laughs> when God anoints a principle in one place, you can take that principle with you to the next place I bet you and can. still find a way. I bet you can. When you see him anoint a principle and work ethic is one of those principles. Purity is one of those principles. There are principles he anoints mm -hmm. in every place. Mm -hmm. So even after, quote unquote, leaving that place, the principle, you, you go into what is next. That's exactly right. Having learned everything in prior places. So even if you find yourself in a new place where you've never been, there are principles at work. That's right. You don't need to know the protocol of the new place if you understand the principles yeah. he has anointed in all the prior places. Absolutely correct. So I got Bible for it. This is Genesis chapter number 26, uh, starting from the 12th verse. And I'm going to read through the 22nd verse, so 10 verses. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted for the Lord blessed him. He became a very rich man and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle and servants that the Philistines became jealous of him. So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father, Abraham. Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. So, Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley, where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. Isaac's servants also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Isaac, which means argument. Isaac's men then dug another well, but again, there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. This time there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space. For he said, at last, the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land you know how they get to Rehoboth work ethic they did not say after Abimelech told them to leave but we dug the well right here mm -hmm. but we dug the well right all here all this work we did all this work we dug the well I ain't digging no other well dang man I already dug a well do it again mm -hmm. there's water wherever you dig but you got to dig. Get it. Don't you, throw your, don't you throw that shovel away. 
You better not throw that shovel away. You better go dig. Seven years I dug this well right here. We started an organization. We got it up and running. Now you want me to go do something else? Yes. You still have a shovel, don't you? Wherever you go dig, water's going to come out, Tim, but you got to dig. So what got him to Rehoboth was a shovel, some calloused hands, and some sweat. They just dug another well. And we got people that are so lazy that the first sign of spring water, they're ready to coast for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. I'd rather stay here and fight than to go dig another well. And it's lazy, fam. If you're thirsty, don't reach for a cup. <sighs> reach for reach the shovel. For the shovel. Ooh, we. Gucci. That's nasty. That's nasty. Well, I already dug the well, so I should just be able to grab the cup and drink anytime I want. Sometimes the well intentionally dries up mm. or is covered up mm. just to keep these muscles at work. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Atrophy is a real thing. It is. Spiritually, physically. Oh, absolutely correct. Relationally. Emotionally, financially. But the giftings and callings of God are irrevocable, Preston. That means okay. I can never lose it. Uh, oh, Sure. Mm. Mm. Let me say this. Mm. Ever seen a gift sit on a shelf? What good is a gift on a shelf? Okay, so it's in your garage. All right, you got it. It's not doing anything for the you. The bike is in the garage, exactly but you right. don't ever ride it. That's exactly right. So you get to keep yeah. it. And I don't even know what that means. Yeah, exactly. Because to me, it's really about the oil that That's comes exactly with right. the gift. That's exactly not right. Not the gift that contains right. the oil. That's exactly right. Something I, I saw in, in the verses you read, a principle that I haven't seen before. Interestingly enough, Abimelech always drives out those with power. Mm. Just the food for thought. Mm. Abimelech always... What does he say? You've become too, too powerful, powerful for, us. for us. He wasn't even threatening with the power that he had. He just had it. God determined the increase, the hundredfold increase. I love that look on your face, by the way, because I love you so much. <laughs> I already know what you're thinking. God determined the increase. Yep. But the man had to do the work. And he did the work. He did the work. He did the work. That success wasn't just a promise left over by his daddy. It was him applying by faith the promise he inherited and watching it go to work for him. He didn't just wake up with he cattle. Did not. He did not just walk it out. No, he, he worked did. it out. He, he worked it out. With fear and trembling, yes, he we did. work it he out. Worked. We don't just walk it out. That's right. We do walk by faith, but we work it out. That's exactly right. With fear and trembling, That's exactly we right. can't just sit. No, we cannot. No, now, we're we not cannot. to be busy bodies. No, we cannot. But Tim, mm -hmm. when, when I have a young leader come up and say something really extravagant about their calling, typically one of the first things I say is, don't tell me. Mm. Show me. That part. Okay, so you can eloquently tell me what you're gifted to do. Right. Great. Yeah, awesome. But can you show me? That's right that you're willing to do what no one else around you is willing to do. That's right. Mm. What work will you put into this? One of the things I love about as Jesus goes and picks his disciples, what were they doing? They was all at work. They was at work, fam. He caught them on the job. On the job. Is it possible we've so over-spiritualized this whole thing? He, just sitting on the beat, watching. Is it possible he was putting them through a job interview when they didn't even know he was watching? He was watching the whole time. He handpicked them. <sighs> Timmy, this he is He chose one men with work ethic. Lord, have mercy on my whole soul. I'm seeing it. I'm watching it right now. He's never, about to use some batting, never not watching. That's exactly right. He's watching us work at all times. He is interviewing me for tomorrow's place by watching what I do 
today in the place where no one else watches me. Today is a job interview. Yes, sir, it is. Or tomorrow. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Every waiting season is a working season. If you want to go there, you got to work your way there. I, he gave me a three-year heads up. I didn't know the transition was coming, but I remember uh, before he let me in on this little secret about transitioning the pillar, mm -hmm. I felt the Lord say, Preston, I'm giving you three years to prepare for the biggest transition of your life. Mm. That sentence, Tim, is one I will take to my grave mm -hmm. because it wasn't a statement. It was a principle. Mm -hmm. He gives us a heads up. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. So when he when he gives us a, a snapshot of the place, yeah. great. Yeah. But I don't want to celebrate like I'm already there. Right. It's so you let me stand on the stage of the improv. Great. Right. Okay. Exactly. You sh you give me a picture right. of the place. Right. I get a snapshot. Yeah. Okay, great. Then you give me time to prepare, which is a test in and of itself. It is. It really Once is. Once I tell you it's coming. What will you do until we get there? That's exactly right. And one of the best answers is, I will prepare so that when we get there, I don't just visit there. I can steward whatever you want me to do there. But Timmy, I think what, what, part of where some people get sideways is just off of the phrase, the land of the promise or the promised land. They fixate on the promise. The, correct me if I'm off here, okay? But for me personally, when he told me at 18 that Scottsdale was the place, I would, by the end of my life, after yep. serving more than half of my life mm -hmm. in this valley, serving mm -hmm. him and these people, mm -hmm. well, he told me that at 18. Yep. Okay. I don't see the place as the promise. I see the place as a responsibility. That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely what it is. To me, he wasn't telling me, I have something special for you. He was saying, I have an assignment for you. And a responsibility. And when we are a little less mature, we take the promise and we celebrate it. When we're a little bit more mature, I think we look at the promise and say, whoa, that's a weighty responsibility that I'm not yet ready for. I must go to work. Where's my shovel and my sword? It makes me want to preach a sermon, and this would be in, in, the, in, the, in the category of a Bishop Jake sermon. I, I, I want to preach a sermon one day called The Heifer and the Hives. <laughs> My titles suck compared to yours. <laughs> I've been the Heifer. You had me at the Heifer. <laughs> it is my assignment and to sermonize from the subject. Please don't. The Heifer and the Hives. I, that's what this, this, this is literally what he's saying. What you think, what you've romanticized as a promise, what I've promised you is heifers and hives. I've promised you cramped hands from squeezing udders and bumpy arms from grabbing honeycomb. I did not promise you a resort with a glass of milk and a jar of honey. I promised you heifers and I promised you hives. And if you get a glass of milk and you're able to sweeten your bread with honey, it's because of the work you put in. Squeezes and stings. Milk and honey only comes from squeezes and stings. Chow, 
if y'all don't realize that we just gave y'all three or four sermons <laughs> and sermon titles, nah, bro, thank you. Thank you for musing with me on this because it's a, it's a, if, if those that are into TLC get, if you get this revelation, the earlier you get what we're saying, the better your experience and your journey with the Lord is going to be. Because you're not going to be longing for places. You're literally going to be grateful that he's lit up the path that he wants you to go on. And again, Prez's journey is not my journey. My journey is not his. Our journey is not yours. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the path he has put you on. And you'll get a revelation about God that you could have never have received if you would have stayed in the place. On behalf of my twin brother, Preston Morrison, <laughs> I have been Tim Ross. And until next time, peace.